let's get started. So I want to say thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, very excited to have this session. Um, I think it's a, an important topic and I think it's one that people are interested in, in because with the changing times right now to, to see what one of our most important departments is doing and how they're handling things. Um, so I want to thank Mike Ertz for taking the time to host the webinar today. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, during the webinar, feel free to ask questions. Um, just try to keep things on mute just so we don't get a lot of background noise. So if you want to ask your question, you can just unmute yourself. Um, if you don't feel comfortable asking on, you can put it in a chat question and I'm happy to uh, wash your hands. Um, oh, this guy's awesome. if you yeah, everything on mute, that would be this great. Um, and we can get started. So the first question I have for Mike is first, tell me how, tell us how you and your family are doing. Well, we're, we're doing fine. Thank you. Um, you know, a couple of the, luckily we're all healthy. Uh, having three teenagers at home is, uh, it's, there's been some great parts to it and there's been some challenges to it, as you can imagine. But, you know, thankfully we are home and we're, we're doing all right. I know my boys don't seem to be bothered at all because um, they can be on the internet with their friends all the time. My daughter, not so much. Um, the other thing I'm finding is I cannot believe how much five people can eat when you're at home all day. Um, I can't keep up, but uh, we're doing well, and I hope everyone out there is doing well. And I just wanted to quickly add before we get started, uh, it's so great to see so many familiar names out there. Um, it's, it's got me excited, so I'm, I look forward to this. Good, good. Um, so let's get into this. So as the director of a large athletic department, how have you adapted <clears throat> um, and accounted for some of the challenges brought on by COVID-19 that pertain to your communication, your staffing, scheduling, budget, and then fundraising and alumni relations? Well, as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's been pretty challenging, uh, to be honest. Uh, you know, as we mentioned quickly before we got on air officially, um, everyone has a lot of questions, as we all know. And, you know, just like you hear when it's the governor or the politicians or what have you, we don't have answers. Uh, it, it's not nice to be, if you want to say, in charge or oversee people. And, you know, a lot of why we do what we do is because we like to help others. I mean, that's what got me into athletic administration. That's why we coach. That's why we try to lead in our business areas because um, of the fulfillment of trying to help others. And when I get questions from all of our staff and our students, uh, student athletes, um, and I don't have answers, I, it drives me nuts. It's frustrating. But uh, at the same time, the, the tough challenge is I don't want to uh, deflate their spirits. So even though I might have some personal apprehensions and fears about what the immediate future might look like, I don't want to pass that along to staff. If you will, it's kind of like being a parent with young kids in the woods. You, you, you don't want to show your fear. Um, but uh, at, at any rate, that's been pretty challenging. The, the second piece is, uh, you know, it, obviously we're not playing games right now. And some might think, oh, there's, there's nothing to do. Well, it's anything but. I mean, our lives have been turned upside down. Um, and I don't want to make it sound as though, you know, sports is more important than everything else in life because it isn't. But that being said, you know, this is what we do and this is what we love to do. Um, and uh, um, the amount of, I'm overwhelmed and inundated with questions and emails on a daily basis. And that's what I am trying to get through and navigate through every day. You know, from a budget standpoint, there's not a lot of business going on right now because we don't have any money. Um, and, and, and we have to be strategic about what we're going to do based on the information we have because you know, as I've mentioned in some other interviews, we, we have to be cautious about making a plan for the fall until we know for a fact that we're going to be open, um, which is tough because it's tough to play the waiting game if you're a fall sport, per se, and you need to get your helmets or your soccer balls. Uh, but at the same time, we can't buy them if we don't have a budget and we don't come back. So, I, as I said, it's trying to really massage uh, the tough conversations with our coaches uh, tell them to just, you, you got to sit and wait, but got to be prepared to strike when, when we know. Uh, so I'd say that's the biggest challenge. And then the, how I'm communicating with staff is uh, um, I don't like to do a ton of emails. I don't like to do, my management style is not about being doom and gloom and a lot of what ifs, which our staff has appreciated. I told them that the longer we wait, 
the more information, whether it's good or bad, but the more solid information we're going to have. And so I've been using that. I reach out to them about once a week, hopefully with some good news. Um, and uh, uh, then I talk to them individually. I try to call each coach about every week just to check in to make sure that they know we're thinking of them. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's about it right now. And, and really starting to have a lot of conversations on our campus in our conference with the NCAA um, about what things might look like as we approach the fall here. Good. So can, as you talked about your staff, can you tell, tell us how your staff is, is handling things and how they're managing things while they're at home? Uh, you know, they're, they, they're doing a great job. They really are. I, I, I applaud them. I appreciate them. Um, as much as, you know, they want answers about, hey, can we get an, our assistant coaches and what's our budget? When I tell them we have to wait, they've been such great professionals about it. They have a complete understanding. You know, they're thankful to be at Cortland, to be honest with you, because I, I will tell you that everyone's going through tough times not right now. We know that. We know that high school and every university and college is going through tough times. But what I'll share with you is Cortland is in a better position as an institution, not just within athletics, but as an institution than a lot of other schools out there right now to be able to handle this uh, insurmountable adversity, it feels. And our coaches are thankful and appreciative that even if we're going to have to tighten the belt, which we will, um, I, I think they're thankful they're at Cortland and we're getting the support we get. They get the support they get as opposed to what they're hearing from their colleagues on other campuses. It's getting a lot tougher. Um, you know, for instance, you know, the elephant in the room, our coaches haven't been furloughed yet. We're very thankful for that. You know, there's a lot of other schools that can't say the same. Um, so we're kind of counting our blessings and, and getting ready to just play when they tell us we can play. And they've been great. They've been great. That's good. So how about the athletes? How do you think they're managing through all this? And what challenges do you think they're facing or they feel like they're facing? Well, I, I, I don't know other than when I get the feedback from our coaches. Our coaches have done, again, a wonderful job. Uh, I encourage them to stay connected um, with their teams, which they already do, and they already know that. But going back to having a household with three teenagers, one at 19, one at 17, and then a 13-year-old, just seeing some of the challenges with our 19 and 17-year-old kind of prompted me to say, hey, coaches, you, you know, I'm, I know many of them are handling it well, but stay connected because they need it right now. And I'm seeing how my teenagers are kind of walking around in zombie land and, and they're struggling a little bit. So our coaches have been very creative about doing a lot of the, you know, a lot of the Zoom calls, a lot of team activities, uh, whether it's team workouts or TikToks and all the fun stuff you're seeing. Our coaches have been very creative in staying uh, very well entrenched with our teams. And, you know, they're doing positional meetings. They're doing any virtual team building exercise you can think of just trying to keep them engaged and also we're reaching out to them individually to help them with their, like their academics and what things might look like for, you know, student athletes that maybe missed a spring and now they're trying to reconfigure. Our coaches have been uh, rock stars and, and they talk to their players every single day, every single day. So can't be more thankful for them. And they've got, I have to tell you too, they've gotten very creative in, in, in some of what they're doing. You know, we have a baseball coach that is inviting alumni uh, maybe some prominent alums like a major league umpire and a division one coach to have evening calls where the team and some others can get on and just kind of get engaged with alumni. Um, and, he, and we have several other coaches doing the same with alumni trying to get both the alumni and the teams to interact together. So like I said, they've been really, really good. They're making me look good right now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's great to hear. So can you tell us how does the NCAA are they allowing additional eligibility to spring student athletes impact roster limits? And do they foresee many spring athletes fulfilling their eligibility? Uh, first, uh, yes, they've already granted all spring sport athletes the, uh, an additional year of eligibility. So they didn't lose anything there. Um, it, in, at our level, division three, we don't have roster limits like you'll get at division one, say. Um, and there is discussion with Division One and the NCAA about how they're going to navigate through that with both roster limits and scholarships. Uh, that doesn't apply to us at Division III. Uh, as far as the seniors go for spring sports, I, don't, I would say it's less than 50% of them are coming back. 
Um, you know, everyone, it's like anything else. When you hear it, like, oh, that's good. They get their year back. Well, you have to realize that, you know, many of them have had, they have their plans and they're ready to graduate. They're ready to go student teach. They're ready to go to grad school. And as much as we say, oh, well, you get one more year to play. Well, when you're in the middle, of, I mean, four years to play a college sport is a blink of an eye. I mean, when you're in the middle of it, it might feel like a long time. But when you look back, it, it, it's a blink of an eye. And, and so many of them are ready to move on. So even though they're, they're eligible to play again, you know, we have many that are not because they're, they're, they're going on and they want to keep moving with their lives. And, and some, frankly, are going to be in some financial challenges with their family. So you can appreciate all that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting dynamic um, because the coaches as well, I mean, they're getting ready for those seniors to leave. So they have a bunch of freshmen coming in to try to compete for those jobs. And now you have the dynamic of you still got to bring your freshmen in. You want to bring your freshmen in, but you have seniors coming back. So the coaches have a little balancing act there as well. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how are you preparing for the fall? Well, we are preparing as though we're going to play. Um, and, you know, we all know our coaches stop in on a daily basis or call me or email me that there's a chance that, we don't, the, the, the fear of the unknown might be that they're, we're not playing, but right now we're preparing as though we're going to play. And in fact, it's a lot of work because, you know, I'm a part of the campus committee and I'll uh, be responsible for the athletics portion of it, but, but we're putting a team together as we speak and to, de to determine all the logistics of what you're going to have to do in order to be able to play, uh, whether it's health and safety, um, social distancing, all, all the things we're hearing in the news, that will certainly apply to us. Um, for, for campus life activity, as well as uh, collegiate athletics. So we're, we're, we're diving into it. There's a lot out there, unfortunately, that we have to get through and then build a plan. And we are really just getting started. Uh, some of that, I'll be honest with you, is with intention. Some schools are jumping right out there and making all these what ifs. I uh, am of the mindset that I wanna kind of wait and, and, and position ourselves and see how much more we can learn. I don't wanna do a lot of work that we don't need to do. And I don't want to make a lot of plans to go in one direction when we find out in July that we didn't have to do that or we can do this. So it's kind of like prepare behind the scenes, but kind of sit and wait because the longer we wait, the more information we get, whether it's good or bad. Um, no different than an alum, Greg Sankey. I kind of follow in his lead. Greg Sankey's the commissioner of the SEC. He's a Cortland grad, as some of you or hopefully many of you know. And I just read a quote from him on Friday. Um, I mean, it was on a much bigger scale. I think it was in for some NCAA something. And he, he said just that, you know, we know a lot more today than we did 30 days ago. So the longer we can wait, the more information we're going to have to make uh, healthy and strong and you know, smart decisions. Good. Well, this is the time that I'm going to leave it open for some questions. So I'm going to unmute everybody. Please. Um, so please, this is time to ask him anything. If your microphone doesn't come unmuted, you might have to do it on your, your side. Um, but if you have some questions, feel free to ask Mike. He's here to answer any questions you might have. Hey, Mike. Mike Fusilli. <laughs> hey, Mike. So Old Dominion, uh, Furman, most recently Central Michigan have all dropped sports teams because, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, is that something you feel that maybe those programs are in trouble or do you think that uh, the pandemic has had that much of an impact financially for those schools to drop programs and do you foresee anything like that happening to Cortland because of the pandemic? That's a great question, Mike. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a long answer, so stay with me, everybody, and there might be some follow-up questions, but that's a very good question. Um, first uh, and foremost, Cortland is not even entertaining dropping a sport. It's not even a part of the discussion. I will tell you other schools, even at our level, are talking about it. I think, uh, uh, you know, and now go back to the Division I. Uh, if those of us that are old enough on this call remember um, our, our last uh, crash and the housing crash in 2008, you know, the, the bubble burst. Okay. And I think I, I see uh, Shirley on here. I know she can appreciate it because her and I have talked and she's been an edge. She's been in athletics and education a little bit longer than I have. And I've talked about this for years. I've been doing athletic administration for 20 years. I think 
for many years, even at the Division Three level, the tail's been wagging the dog a little bit too much, and we've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I've always felt it's unsustainable. I think, you know, you, you go to Division One, that's exacerbated, exacerbated exponentially. Um, and so they've gotten way too big. We've heard about it for years and uh, that they're, it's costing them too much money to do their business because they're trying to keep up in football and basketball. And so in order to do it, they've been cutting sports. And we've been seeing it happen from time to time over the last 10, 15 years. Well, I think the answer is twofold. Number one, we, I'm sure we've all heard the expression now that no one, everyone wants to take advantage of the crisis, right? I think there's always been, I know there has even in our level that people have wanted to, they've talked about dropping sports for years, but no one wants to do it because you always get that negative pushback, you know, from the, whether it's the alumni, the families or what have you. Uh, well, now's the opportunity to say, hey, all bets are off because this is a, a serious financial crisis. And so I think people are taking advantage of that opportunity, frankly. I think the division ones not only have to, because they flat out can't afford to offer all the sports when they're losing so much revenue. What, and it's not just about scholarship. I mean, those that either have been at that level or seen that level, you know, a couple of their sports might be able to break even or, or try to keep up with the Joneses. But when you're trying, we've grown so much in every sport that whether you're a, a football player or a volleyball player or cross country or baseball, they get so much given to them. We don't hear about it in the national news. All you hear about is they need to be paid to play, which I think is ridiculous. Um, but they get so much. And that money, it's not, it doesn't grow on trees. That comes from the institutions. So this is an opportunity for those institutions to scale back and say, hey, we're not going to offer a lot of some of these sports that maybe aren't driving our enrollment and certainly aren't generating any revenue for our campus. In fact, it's costing us a ton of money. So that, that's what I think that is happening. And I think you're going to see a lot more of it. I think schools that like the, when you think about the division three schools, which is the vast majority, there's 487 of us. Um, the smaller ones need to be careful about this because those that have maybe paid attention in our industry, athletics was always the, the, the problem that cost too much money. Well, that philosophy has changed over the last eight years or so with the smaller private schools, for instance, because they're struggling for enrollment big time. And I'm not going to name names right now, but there's a lot of schools in New York. There's a lot of schools in, in Massachusetts and in the Northeast that are struggling to meet enrollment numbers and they're using athletics to get bodies on their campus. So they, even though athletics cost them money, if they don't offer that sport, you know, if you are, if you're a smaller school and you offer men's lacrosse and you're not traditionally a, maybe a, a, a male uh, oriented uh, campus, that's 40 male uh, students that are not coming to your campus and won't be there. So they need to be careful about dropping because they know it actually gets them bodies on their campus. Great. I hope I answered your question. And if I didn't, you can re-ask it and I'll try again. <laughs> oh, I, just, I wanted to get your, uh, your sentiment on it. Thank you. Yep. How about anybody else? Anybody else have some questions for Mike? Come on, someone's got to have a good question. Oh, you see, uh, Ithaca College is opening back up, but they're opening up, uh, you know, a month later, uh, October fifth. I mean, what, what implications? I know I was on the athletic website a couple of days ago on, on their college's website. Um, what implications does that have for their fall sports? I mean, if they come, if they don't have students on campus till the fifth of October, I mean, and let's say, you know, Cortland opens up, and other schools in their and maybe in their conference open up on time, you know, what? How do they play that out? Yeah, well, I don't think we have all the information. I don't want to speculate or put the put words in the mouths of Ithaca College right now. I do plan on calling their athletic director, Susan Bassett. She's, uh, she's fantastic. She's a great athletic director. We have a great relationship. I'm waiting a few days because my guess is she's getting absolutely slammed with questions right now. Um, so I'm giving it a little time. But uh, I do want to check in because – uh, it's kind of like we heard a little bit out in California. It's related anyway. When they talk about, oh, they're not opening schools. Well, they never said they weren't playing sports. In fact, you're now starting to hear in California that at least the higher level, I think they still plan to play sports. Um, so without, I don't want to, well, this is speculating a little bit, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ithaca might have a plan to bring their athletes back a little sooner. Um, get them, what do you want to call it, uh, quarantine for 14 days. Let them be the test run. 
and then they'll play an abbreviated season potentially, maybe miss their first three weeks of play. But we they haven't come out and said they're not playing sports until October 5th. So until I hear that, I don't have a strong opinion. But that being said, even before any of this came out, when this thing first started, or at least maybe up the, after the first two weeks, a lot of us were saying, hey, we can really see an abbreviated fall season coming our way in high school and college. So this might just be them leading by example. I'm actually applaud them for picking a date because I think they're trying to set the tone. We're hearing other schools do it as well. They're setting the tone that we're going to open. Now, some other schools have to do this. And I'm not saying this is Ithaca per se, but you're going to hear more and more smaller privates just flat out say we're opening and here's the date because there's a lot of unknowns out there about kids coming into campus. And, you know, we're all hearing that if the college isn't fully open, I'm not coming. I'll stay home for the year. I'll just take online classes at community college or I'll take them at Cortland. But for some of these privates, they know that if they say we're online only, they will not have students on their campus. So I think you're going to see more and more privates, which I love because they're, they're, they're kind of forcing the tone in a positive way that we're going to be open. We're going to play. It's happened in Wisconsin. You're seeing it out of private schools every day. And in fact, I'm hoping some of the SUNY schools start doing the same. Um, so I think it's good news. And as I said, I'm going to check in with Susan over at Ithaca probably by the end of this week to see what they're doing behind the scenes to plan for athletics. But, you know, I'll tell you right now, if you ask any of our fall coaches right now, if I sit and I've already asked one this morning, so I kind of know the answer. Uh, it's not just me speculating. If I said, hey, you either can't play or we're going to play, but you're going to play about 60% of your season. We're going to start October 10th. They'll all take it right now. They just want to be with their athletes. You know, they want to practice. They want to play. You know, there, there might be some student athletes that say, you know, I don't want to play. I don't want to burn my year if it's only 60%, but a lot of them do. At the end of the day, I think the silver lining is it almost goes back to Mike Fusilli's question about some schools dropping sports. And, and my answer was we've gotten way too big and we've lost sight of what's important. We see it in youth sport. We see it in travel sports. Like our soccer coach was in here this morning, Steve Axtell, Cortland grad, mind you, um, and said, you know what? Part of this silver lining is my student, my players, they don't care if they get a backpack. They don't care about an athletic trainer. They don't care about who we're playing. If we have to play eight games, they just want to come get on the field after school, go practice and go play if we get to play. And if you think about it, that's what it's supposed to be. So the silver lining to all this is hopefully it's kind of pulling us back and reminding us of why we do what we do. And the fact that since a lot of us that are sport oriented have loved this stuff since for little kids, but my son, my 13 year old has played more basketball in the driveway in the last three weeks than he has his first 12 years of life. So I think some of that is a little bit of a breath of fresh air. Now, again, the big picture were, you know, economics and jobs and, and people's safety is really important, but the silver lining in, in our industry is that, Hey, you know, let's remember what we do here and why we do it and what we're here for. So I kind of like it. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm glad I'm not in a gym every weekend at AAU basketball with my daughter. I love it. <laughs> so to kind of go on that, a quick question that I have is when this, if the students get to come back and they get to play and, and one of the guidelines is that they can't play in front of um, like attendees, how do you think the students will feel and how will you keep them their morale up with it being so different? Honestly, <laughs> I uh, I don't want to say they won't care because certainly they want people there, but in a lot of our sports, and I, and this isn't just division three, you can go over to Cornell, you can go over to Colgate, you can go to Syracuse. Uh, with the exception of maybe a couple sports, I'll throw football out there for an example where it's once a week and you get a lot more of the community and the student body. You know, largely you go to a lot of our weekday games and, and you really got the, the friends and family of the players of both teams. And so they would survive without it. Um, I do hope that, and I, I actually, I'm, I think this is going to happen. I know we're, we're currently hearing we're going to play with no fans. Mm -hmm. I would be more surprised than not surprised if uh, we have nobody in the crowd come fall for playing. I could see a scenario where we're going to say, hey, you can let parents, because we'll, we'll fight, hey, can we let parents come? We can monitor and police, the, you know, social distancing, if you will, to let parents come. And frankly, for most of the sports, that's all, that's, that's everyone there anyway. <laughs> and if we can do that so the parents can watch their kids play and that that's going to be my, the, 
my charge for it. And then they can gather with their families after a game, win, lose, or draw. Again, that's what it's all about. So if they tell us no fans, we'll deal with it. Coach, the coaches and the coaches will probably love it because they're not getting yelled at. And administrators <laughs> will love it because we don't have to go deal with parents yelling at the officials. So um, <laughs> it'll be a little bit surreal. We've heard about that a little bit, like in the NASCAR, you know, that got us feel weird. But we'll adjust, and, and they would just they just want to play. They just want to play games. They just want to practice. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for Mike? Quiet. They're quiet. Quiet. Now. They're quiet group. So Mike, the, the, this is John Mertz. Does the, um, the conference dictate uh, how things will take place with athletics? Uh, you know, the SUNY system take, where does, where does the hierarchy come in this whole thing? Sure. Yep. Uh, good question. Sure. Yep. Uh, good question. Um, if, uh, 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 Mr. Mertz, if you could uh, mute it now. Thank you. Um, the, we, we, are, we do have conference uh, meetings uh, every Monday morning. That, that what, the only thing the conference can determine is if we end up modifying conference play, but they won't tell you as an institution if you do or do not play. Um, but where the hierarchy comes is the governor's got to just tell us as a state agency, if you will, that you can be open for business. And if, you, if so, it's got to look like this. So we're ultimately governed by the governor, if you will. And then it'll go in, then from the governor goes to SUNY and the SUNY system, and then from SUNY to the campuses. Um, I'm getting this, I mean, SUNY and all, every, there, there isn't a president in the country that says we have to open, we got to figure it out because they understand the economic devastation if you have to go online. So I think SUNY and the presidents are all gonna try to say, hey, if there's any way we can have some form of physically being on campus, we, there's gotta be a will and a way to do it. But ultimately we have to get the blessing and we gotta be a part of that, that phasing, which you kind of see in there, generally speaking, from the governor's office to say, yes, this, you know, the state university systems can open up because you meet X, Y, and Z. So uh, that's, I hope I answered your question, but I think ultimately it's gonna lie in the governor's office. As opposed to, excuse me, as opposed to private schools, they can do whatever they want. That's why a lot of them are saying we're opening. We're gonna figure it out one way or another. Great question. Any additional questions? What's Eric's take on all of this? <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, he's, he's been a trooper, you know, he's, he's remaining positive. Um, he's not tipping his hand, I'm sure, as a president, a longstanding, great president. He, he's probably sleeping less at night, and he, do, he already doesn't sleep that much as it is. Um, <laughs> but he, he's been positive, and he, he's still of the mindset where there's a will, there's a way, and let's put our heads together and figure this out. He's been really positive. I'm sure a lot of you have seen his messaging going out to the alumni groups. He's doing the same thing with the students. Um, he's still, and he's still engaged and active in every area. I mean, heck, I'm kind of inundated with how much I'm being asked to be a part of different groups and, and, and Zoom calls and, and this, that, and the other thing. I can't imagine what he's going through as a president, but he still took the time. Our swim team did a Zoom call a couple weeks ago and our coach invited him to jump on and five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever it was, he jumped on the call. So he's still, he's still Eric. I mean, he's still president <laughs> Bitterbaum. He's been great. Uh, I don't know. I haven't talked to him in about a week, but he, he's been, he's been really transparent about sharing any document he gets. He shares with the leadership on campus. Um, and he's, he still seems of the mindset that we're going to open somehow, some way which I love, I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, I'll, I'll take it one step further. He's told the other SUNY presidents that we're, we're playing sports in the fall. And I love that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? Do you have any other comments, Mike, that you'd like to say to the group before we end it? Oh, uh, I, I guess I would just add that, uh, you know, it's, it's great that people are looking out for us, thinking about us, you know, we're thinking about you. you know, I think the, it, it is, I'll tell you this, as a person that's been driving into this place nearly seven days a week for about 30 years, um, 
it's eerie still to me when I have to drive by our fields and see them so uh, totally empty. It's eerie to me when I have to walk through this park center building and only see two or three bodies. Um, and it's, and it hasn't gotten any easier. Um, and knowing all the, you know, the spring championships we just missed was a, it was more than a little disheartening and I feel bad for our coaches and our athletes big time. Um, but I, I, I feel so good about being at Cortland and being a part of Cortland because, you know, our, our alumni support and our family support and our campus support is, is just so strong right now. I mean, it, it's not even like, the good news is for us is it's not an if, it's just like, hey, when do we get to get going again? You know, so many of us are wired to, you know, and maybe it's a lot of us are so driven by, you know, we live to face adversity. I mean, that's what you do in sport. And I think that we've got dealt a tough hand here, but it's not even a, a matter of, oh my gosh, what do we do? It's like, hey, just let us know when, you know, what the playing rules are and we'll play and we're going to win. We'll figure it out. And I know it sounds a bit cliche, but like all of our coaches are chomping at the bit, our student athletes are chomping at the bit, our, our faculty are chomping at the bit. I mean, I, it's just what they're doing to help some of our students and student athletes right now, because going back to where we were initially, some of them are struggling. Some of, some of them are, are stuck in areas that they don't have a lot of support. Um, and, and so our faculty are reaching out to help them navigate through this. Uh, they're copying me on it if it's a student athlete. And it's just the resilience factor at Cortland is, is showing stronger now than it ever has. I mean, and then the second piece I'll add to that is I, this is the stage where you start having a lot of al alumni engagement, and I miss that. Um, I'm really hopeful to get some alumni uh, activity going on and as soon as we can. Knowing that we don't have alumni weekend, again, is a crushing blow to me because I love it. But I just, I, I'm very hopeful um, that we're going to be able to see each other all in the fall. And if not, like I said, you know, here we're just like, all right, we'll just adjust and make it work. And if we have to wait till spring, we'll wait till spring. But we're going to do it. You know, we're going we're gonna to have a Hall of Fame weekend. You know, I'll do it at my house. I'll do it on Christmas Day. I don't care. But we're going to have all the so, uh, That's what's great about Cor that's what's great about Cortland. It, it it is. If people don't panic when there's adversity, people just put your head down, team up, and get after it. And that's kind of what we're going to do. Good. And thanks for being interested in coming on today. Well, thank you, Mike. We appreciate your time, and I think that was. It's great information to hear, and I think there's so many people who are rooting for your department and hoping for the best for everybody and can't wait to get back to some normalcy. I think we're all looking to do that and just can't wait to get back to it. So yes, we appreciate your time very much, and thank you, everybody, for who attended. We appreciate you joining us and participating with Mike today, so thank you. Let's go. Thank, thank you. you Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You. Yeah, you too. You. Bye. Bye. All right, thank you.